So I've been wanting to learn how to make 3D carves on my CNC for a while now because that's something I love to incorporate into my furniture designs. And with all the hype around Game of Thrones the last few months, I thought it'd be the perfect time to dive into it so that I could make a Game of Thrones topography map. And man, I had no idea what an ambitious project this turned out to be or just how successfully it ended up failing twice. So stick around and I'll go over all the softwares I learned to create the 3D model and the tools I used on my CNC. I also go over why the project project ultimately failed and my takeaways. So let's get started. The first thing I had to do is trace the outline of the map. I found and downloaded a map off the internet that included Westeros and a portion of Essos where most of the TV show took place in. And then I placed the image in Adobe Illustrator to start tracing. Illustrator has a function to help simplify this. It's called Image Trace, which will basically turn any image into a vector graphic, just like it's doing here. But with any automatic tools like this, it's not perfect. So I had to clean up the image by deleting unnecessary vectors and then add in vectors that weren't generated properly. If you're like me and have never used Illustrator before, I've left a link to a great tutorial I found down below in the descriptions. After saving off the vector map as an SVG file, it can then be imported into Fusion 360 to prepare for modeling. To get a realistic terrain into the model, I want to use existing geographical files out there and map it over this profile. In my case, I used a website called terrain to stl You can see here just how much data there is to choose from. Since we're looking for something that matches the topography of Westeros and Essos, I found a really detailed Game of Thrones map on Quartermaster.info. I basically went back and forth between these two sites until I found a region of the terrain map that matched with the fictional map, and then I downloaded it. This mesh file currently has too many faces for Fusion 360 to handle, so what we need to do is remesh the current triangulated mesh into a quad mesh using a free software called Instant Meshes. But first we need to clean up the STL file using Blender. After importing the STL file into Blender, you can see the model has nearly 400,000 faces. The face limit in Fusion is 20,000, so if we'd simply reduce the face count in Fusion 360, we would have lost a lot of detail and smoothness. In order for instant meshes to work with this file, I went into edit mode to remove the four side walls around the model and then clean up any duplicate faces and vertices. And what I'm left with is just a clean mesh of the terrain surface, ready to be remeshed. In order to remesh the file into quad mesh, all I had to do was click on the two solve buttons and then click on export mesh button. The important thing is to make sure to check the pure quad mesh box before clicking the extract mesh button. And then save this as your final mesh. You'll end up with a detailed mesh that Fusion can handle. And with all that done, I imported the mesh into Fusion 360 and moved it around to match the Quartermaster map the best I could. Before I can actually do any modeling with the meshes, I had to convert them to B-Reps. To do this, I first converted the mesh from Quad Mesh to T-Spline, and then converted it again from T-Spline to B-Rep. I broke the map into different sections, so this mesh is only for the northern part of Westeros. Reason is because it's really difficult to clean up the mesh properly once it got too large, and it was also impossible to find the terrain that matched properly. Next, I repeated all the same steps for the southern half of Westeros. And now I can use regular modeling operations with Infusion to make my own map. I did this by first extruding the surface of Westeros, making sure the extruded surface completely covers the mesh. Since the terrain surfaces are split into two bodies, I also had to split the new extrusion into two, or things will not combine properly. Using a sketch, I create a surface that I will use to split everything with. Then I use the split bodies function again to split the map extrusion with the corresponding terrain surface. Just like magic, now I've got a topographical map of Westeros. And now I just repeated the same process for the rest of the map. Finally, I made a sketch of a rectangle and extruded that for the base of the map. And as a final touch, I extruded another sketch for the wall. Now that the CAD model is ready, it's time to move on to CAM. In the manufacturing workbench, click on New Setup, and the first thing I did was define the location of the home point by moving my axis. For me, I like to use the bottom left corner of the top surface. 
This is also where we can define the raw material size. I left it as default since I will cut my final workpiece to this dimension. Next, I set up the milling operations and define the tools used for them. The first operation is a 3D adaptive clearing pass using a quarter inch flat end mill which will rough out the final shape. I want to give a big thanks to Tools Today for sending me all the cutting tools for this project. I'll have links to all the tools in the descriptions below. And in the interest of time, I'll also include all the settings I used in the descriptions instead of talking about them in the video. Second operation will be a 3D parallel path. Combine that with a 1 16th taper ball nose bit, it'll give me that smooth, realistic terrain look. However, there's gonna be a little bit more in terms of settings. Under machining boundaries, I picked selection and then clicked around all of the boundaries of each individual landmass. If we don't do this, the bit will go over the entire workpiece, making an already long operation even longer. And the very last operation is a 3D contour using the same 1 16th inch bit. This will allow the tool to cut all the smaller details around the borders of the land. Now that the most difficult parts are done, we just need to select the post processor to generate the G-code for your specific machine. In my case, I'm using Easel. And for X-Carve, I had to post process and save each process separately since the X-Carve cannot automatically switch tools. But before we can start carving, I had to make the stock, which is what you see me doing here. I milled up a bunch of maple, walnut, and cherry, and then glued the layers together. Using contrasting lumber, I'm hoping to give the final piece more depth. After the glue has dried, I came back the next day to flush up the stacks and glue the pieces edge to edge to make one large panel. Now we're finally ready to start carving. I opened up Easel and then imported the G code I saved earlier. After it's loaded, just click Carve to start. Alright, so I stopped the project here so I can go over with you guys what some of the problems were, why they may have happened, what I did to try to fix them, and some takeaways. So the very first problem I noticed was that this part of the map didn't get cleared out properly in the adaptive clearing process. And that's when I realized that the workpiece was actually warped. And basically what happened I think was during the panel glue up, there was a large fluctuation in temperature and humidity here in Ohio. And the workpiece basically sat flat on the CNC bed the entire 14 hours as it did its thing. So naturally the workpiece warped and the cam clamps really didn't do a whole lot trying to clamp it down in the Z direction. I didn't think it was that big of a problem so I proceeded with the parallel pass by first applying some clamps in the Z direction all along the edges. Not a whole lot of force, just enough to keep things from wanting to warp any further. But about 15 hours into the parallel pass, uh, for some reason my CNC spindle just shifted in the x-axis. And I'm not talking about a small 1mm shift, it was like a huge 50mm shift. So I grabbed onto the spindle and I tried to force it back into the position that I think it should be. And what I ended up with were these shallow cuts all along the coastline. Hopefully you can see this. Obviously, my first thought was something got in the way of the spindle, but upon inspection, I couldn't find out what that was, and it still remains a total mystery to me. But what ultimately made me call it quits was when I saw the finishing bit had taken a huge chunk of land out of this area of the map. That's when I realized what I thought was a simple cupping in the workpiece, it's actually twisted. So not enough material was removed during the adaptive clearing in this area, but a lot of material was removed in this upper region. 
But the reason I hadn't noticed it at first was because the adaptive clearing still left a lot of landmass here, but it was just very shallow. But when the finishing bit came across it, it just cleared it completely out. So I did try to remake this project by doing the whole panel glue up again. And what I did differently this time is attaching a piece of MDF to the back of the workpiece. So this keeps my workpiece completely flat on the CNC while it's being carved. It also adds all this material to the side where I can add some clamps in a Z direction instead of using cam clamps. But unfortunately, about 8 hours into the adaptive clearing stage, the CNC shifted in the X direction again, and it just took so much material out of it because it's using the quarter inch end mill, and you can see that it just cut right through this landmass, took a huge chunk out of the wall right here. <laughs> it's almost like when the Night King and his undead dragon just you know blew through the wall. Uh, so unfortunately, the damage was too severe for me to go back and try to fix. But since the shifts occurred at different parts between the first and second runs, I'm fairly confident that the problem wasn't with the G-code or the model. And I think it's really with the limitations of the machine itself. Now, with that said, I'm actually really impressed with what the X-Carve could do, it being a hobby machine. It almost completed the full 30 hours of carving on the first run before a problem occurred. But in the end, I think I just asked a little too much from it. So instead of cutting my losses and moving on from this project, I wanted to bring value to the makers slash DIY community by showing you all the lessons I learned and the process that I took to create something like this. I believe that my modeling technique was correct, that my cam process was correct. I just needed the right shoes to get to that final destination that I was aiming for. And if anyone is interested in the model that I made for this project, I provide a link to it in the descriptions below. Um, if you want to give it a shot on your CNC or 3D print it, please, please, please share it with me. I would love to see this model come to life. And thanks for watching guys, and I'll catch you on the next one.